All right, so Esther chapter 5, just to bring you up to speed where we are in the story. Um, we know from the first couple chapters where King Ahasuerus wanted, needed to find, uh, put away his wife, essentially Vashti, who refused to come when she was called and was just real stubborn, disobedient, and, and wasn't listening to him. So he decided to have this thing where he brought in all these virgins from the, from the kingdom to find a new wife for him. He finds Esther, he chooses Esther. Esther is extremely meek and humble and just a really godly lady and, and didn't require anything and was just, she found favor in the sight of King Ahasuerus and was made the queen. And um, Mordecai is her, her adoptive father and, uh, but is really her cousin and um, he's been taking care of her. He refuses to bow down to Haman, that wicked servant and Haman gets so upset by this that he basically puts in a petition to the king to make this decree that they're going to put all the Jews to death because he didn't like the fact that this is part of his religion, that this is what they believe, that he's not, that no one's going to bow down to him. And he said, if you're not going to bow down to me, then he wants them all put to death. Last week we went over uh, a lot of the similarities between Haman and the Antichrist, right? How they, 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 there's just very... Uh, just the similar traits and in, in the way that they behave um, go, go hand in hand with each other there. So at the end of chapter 4, um, Mordecai is instructing Esther to go to the king, right? And, and to go seek the king and, you know, you might have been brought to this point in your life for such a time as this, is, what, is basically what he's telling her. Like, you don't know. Maybe God has you in this position right now to, to bring salvation to the Jews, to, to be the one that can help and to deliver the Jews out of that wicked Haman's hands, right? You have the opportunity to do this, and she didn't want to do it at first because she's saying, well, you know, I mean, I could be put to death. There's this law that if I just go in under the king and he doesn't call for me, then... I'm going to be put to death unless he, unless he grants me, you know, holds out his scepter and grants me basically forgiveness for coming in when I'm not called for. And she prays about it. They fast about it, right? And that's kind of where we left off in chapter four where she decides, okay, I'm going to do this, but you all need to pray and fast for me and, and I'll go in and do this. So as we get started here, just keep that understanding where, where, where the nerves of Esther must be where it's, it's, a, it's really a, um, a hard thing for her to do, where she, she builds up the courage through prayer and fasting to go in and make this request unto the king. And she's having a hard time, I, I believe, you know, trying to accomplish this, just trying to do this, overcome her fears and, and just be able to go in and do that. But we start off, let's start reading verse number one. Again, the Bible reads, Now it came to pass on the third day, excuse me, this is the third day of fasting. But that she was asking to, 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 to not eat or drink for three days and three nights. That's what she had asked for uh, Mordecai and for all the people to, to just pray for her. So after three days, as it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel, they're praying and fasting, which means that, you know, when you're praying and fasting for all that, she was probably in sackcloth as well. Wherever she was, she was probably humbled herself, just like Mordecai was and just like everyone else was while she's praying and fasting. But now she's coming in before the king, so she puts on her royal apparel. She's done praying and fasting, and she's going to come in and do what, uh, what she needs to do here. And it says that she stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house, and the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. And it was so when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight, and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. So, whew, she's not going to be put to death. She didn't anger him, right? She didn't, she didn't make him upset. She obtained favor. She obtained mercy. And it, it makes sense. I mean, the king did choose her and loved her and, and you know, uh, everything about her to that point, she's been humble as, as far as we know. There's no reason to think otherwise that she's been submissive, obedient, humble in, in everything that she ought to be in a wife for the king. So obviously if she's going to come in before him, he understands, well, I mean, there must be something really big going on here and she obtains favor. Now, 
Not only that, I think primarily that's probably what's going on in his mind and that's what's going on here. But I just want to make this point real quick before we continue on any further because he's going to ask her what she wants. But when you have a difficult task in front of you, you have something that you're going to be scared about, but you know the right thing to do is you just need to face it head on. Right? You just need to deal with it. There's no getting around. There's no other way of dealing with it. You just have to confront it and deal with it face to face. Okay? And this is what Esther is being tasked to do. I mean, she, she cannot skirt around this issue. She has to just deal with it head on. And let's face it, if we could, we'd probably rather, if we, could, if we have any problems and issues in life that we have to deal with, it's a lot easier to sidestep them. It's a lot easier to just say, well, what can I do so that things can just kind of play out and I don't really have to get involved and I don't really just have to be in this great confrontation with someone or some choice or whatever. That would be preferable because most people don't like conflict. You don't want to deal with it. And, and it's true. I mean, I don't like conflict. I want to be at peace as much as possible with everybody. But you know what? There comes a time where you need to just confront things face to face and deal with problems. And in order to do what's right, you need to just build up the courage and deal with things face to face. And this is what Esther does. But what we need to remember and what we need to consider, while we are not Calvinist, we don't think that everything that happens is all just completely controlled and planned by God, just every single step, every single movement, every single bad thing that happens, every single good thing, you know, every single thing is just God like a puppet master pulling the strings where essentially you don't even have any control over it because God's just making people do what they will. We don't believe that. However, just because we don't believe that doesn't mean that God doesn't work in people's lives, especially kings and people of, of, of uh, influence for his will to be done and for blessing to come upon the children of God, especially for them to do work for the Lord. That he will step in sometimes and influence people to do things that he wants to do. It's not this continual thing that's always going on, but this obtaining favor of the king, even if the king didn't have some great you know, favor towards her already, which I believe he did, God could, all, could put that in, her, in his heart to give mercy and for her to obtain favor in his eyes anyways. And the reason why I just make a big point of this is that we need to remember that, you know, while she may have been in that better position, you may not be at some point, but you still need to be able to trust that God is capable of doing anything. I'm going to give you a couple examples of this. Turn uh, back to Ezra, the book of Ezra, just a few pages back from where we are in Esther. Right? These are all in the same collection of books, the same segment, because Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther all take place during the captivity of the children of Israel in Babylon. So they're grouped together in the Bible. And it's right after 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, which covers the whole reign of the kings. I'll go into that another day, just kind of going the whole overview of the Bible and how it's laid together and how, why the books are in the order that they're in, because that's an interesting sermon in and of itself. But um, just a little bit of something to chew on if you didn't already know that. Ezra chapter number one. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So the prophecy that Jeremiah made of the children of Israel being in captivity for those 70 years and then going back into Jerusalem and rebuilding the temple, that needed to be fulfilled. So in order for that to happen, God puts this in the heart of the king to make the proclamation for that temple to be rebuilt. When God wants his will to be done, he can use influence with people, with human beings, to allow for his will to be done. Because the king could have just had a really hard heart and just say, nope, I'm not going to let the people go. Which, in fact, he also did the same thing with Pharaoh. Right? When Pharaoh hardened his heart towards Israel, 
letting Moses go, letting the children of Israel go, God started hardening his heart because he wanted his glory to be that much greater with the great deliverance, with that strong arm, just bring the children of Israel out against all odds with the Pharaoh just being obstinate against them and just not letting them do anything and unwilling to bend. He still made it so that they can be delivered and all the glory and credit goes unto the Lord. But just like it should with the building of the temple. You know, God allowed this to happen in a different way with someone that he's influencing in his spirit to help to work with the Lord, with, with allowing this to happen. Now, we can argue whether or not Cyrus was saved, but that's a different story. The point is he's influencing the spirit. Turn over to Nehemiah chapter 2. So the next book after Ezra is Nehemiah. Look at Nehemiah chapter 2. We're going to see another instance here of Nehemiah receiving blessing from God and receiving favor in the sight of the king to do another important job. Now, he was in a similar position to Esther. And actually, I'm going to start, I didn't have this in my notes, but like, if we look at verse number one, the Bible, the Bible of chapter two, the Bible says, and it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not before, I had not been before time sad in his presence. So here we have Nehemiah. He's a servant to the king, right? He's like a butler or whatever. He's there. He's serving him. He's giving him his wine. He's, he's serving him. And of course, in that job, when you're serving the king, you want to always be happy. You want to have a smile on your face. You want to bring good, a good countenance. You want, to, you want to have good spirits around the king. You don't want to be a downer. You don't want to be going around the king and putting him in a bad mood because you're in a bad mood, right? That's a job where you've got to have that friendly face all the time. And he's saying, look, I have not been with a sad countenance ever in his presence. But now he does have that sadness of face and, and, it, and it all has to do with Jerusalem. Okay, so he says in verse two, wherefore the king said unto me, why is thy countenance sad seeing thou art not sick? He's like, you don't look sick to me. You don't look like you're running a fever. You don't look like you're ill. So, so why are you sad? Why is, why is your face look so sad? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. So now he's fearing, going, uh oh, the king can see my you know, how upset I am. But here we're going to see that he gains favor of the king, just like Esther gains favor of King Ahasuerus going before him, you know, a man that's powerful, that has the ability to put him to death if he so chooses, right? Verse 3 says, and said unto the king, then I was very so afraid, verse 3, and said unto the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchers, lieth waste and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? So now he just, he, just, he tells them, he tells them the truth. He just lays it out there. Well, why shouldn't I be sad? I mean, my homeland is just destroyed. The gates are burned with fire. I mean, everything's just, just destroyed. There's nothing, there's nothing there. It's sad. Verse four, then the king said unto me, for what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. So he's asking God for that help now because the king's now asking him, well, what do you want? And he needs the courage and he needs the strength and he needs to find the right words to be able to ask for what he wants to ask because that's a high stress environment to be in. Now you're face to face with the king and he wasn't even premeditating this. I don't think he wasn't playing. He was just kind of sad already. And then he's, he, he let his guard down of, of showing that he was uh, sad. And then, and then he got afraid because, oh man, he, he, he caught me being sad in his presence, right? And then he says in verse 5, And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be, and when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. So now he's continuing to ask for more and more. Like, okay, well, he's answering my request, so I'm going to keep asking him for more help just to, to get me over there safely and to tell these other governors, other rulers over there, that basically I'm here on the king's command to be able to do this stuff. 
and to give him, you know, free passage and, and to help him out. Verse 8 says, And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me, look at this, according to the good hand of my God upon me. So the king's granting him all these requests, and he's saying, you know what? Because God is blessing. Because God is allowing this to happen. Because God has worked in his heart and, and, and has, has helped through this situation to get this to come to pass. And when there's big things, when you're a servant of the Lord, when you're focused on the things of God, he's to focus on the things of God. He wants that temple rebuilt. He knows that, you know, it's sad that it's not being rebuilt. And this is all in God's timing. And this is why I love how these three books go together so well. We'll get to that in just a little bit on the timing of the Lord. Timing is everything in the book of Esther. We're going to see how amazingly awesome things come together and fit perfectly in this story that, that there's, there's no way God is not involved in the events that transpire in the book of Esther. Let's keep reading here. The Bible says um, in Esther chapter 5, So she obtained favor in his sight, and she comes close to him now. And verse 3 says, Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be even given to thee, it shall be even given thee to the half of the kingdom. And Esther answered, If it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, Cause Haman to make haste, that he may do as Esther hath said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. So this banquet is, is like, a, you know, it's like a feast or a luncheon or whatever, right? So she's going to have some beverages there, some, some food, a little food or whatever, just to probably set the mood and be as, as comfortable as you can to, to make sure that the king is happy, that he's taken care of, that he's pleased, because she's going to bring something heavy, very serious to talk about. So, hey, well, hey, come to this banquet, right? I don't want to talk about this right now. Come to this banquet and bring Haman. Now, she asked for Haman to come. And, and again, that, I think that's bold to even ask for him to be there to confront the wicked person face to face essentially and just have this all out in the open with all parties involved right there. Amen. You know what? That's the right thing to do. Right. Just deal with it and deal with it all face to face. You got important thing, business that needs to be taken care of. You've got problems with people. You know, this is a side note. I wasn't even going to bring this up, but I just thought about this now. When you have problems with people, deal with it face to face. If you've got problems that you can't ignore, you've got problems that you can't forgive, let go, or whatever, if you've got a problem that something needs to be dealt with, deal with it and deal with it face to face. Not by text messages, not by emails, not by phone calls. You know what? When you've got a serious problem, you've got to deal with it face to face. Yeah. I'm so sick of this culture, too, that people are so, are so afraid of conflict. Now, look, no one enjoys it. But when you have to deal with something, just deal with it. That's right. And we've got a culture now where we have neighbors calling police on other neighbors because of some conflict or something that the one neighbor probably doesn't even know anything about. You know, so one neighbor's got a dog barking or something, so people are just going to call the cops instead of just walking over there and being, excuse me, you know, your dog's been barking and barking and barking. Can you please, you know, do something about that? Because it's really bothering me, you know, whatever. Whatever the issue is. These small, minor annoyances. And people are just quick to call, like, hey, can you send a guy with a gun over there to go tell these people to get their dog to be quiet? Like, like that's the first step. Look. Deal with the problem. Deal with it face to face. I know it's uncomfortable. But it's the right thing to do. And, and you know, nine times out of that, way, way more often, the people will, one, show you more respect, and two, probably have a lot more, will, will be a lot more receptive to what you're saying when you approach it that way as a person as opposed to sending someone else over there, some, some force or some authority over there to deal with the problem for you. That's going to make them bitter against you. Who here would just love to have the cops show up at your door 
because some minor thing, some infraction that you might be doing as your neighbor that you didn't even realize it was wrong, the likelihood of you being embittered against that person is really high. Be like, man, I don't want anything to do with that person, and you better watch out because if you do something I don't like, guess what? You're getting the cops called on you. That's how most people are going to respond. Now, that's not the Christian way to be. We ought to just be able to let it go and just say, well, whatever, you know, maybe we could just send them some cookies or something and apologize and just try to get this thing to blow over. But that's not how most people are going to respond. <laughs> and in order to do things right, again, you, you may end up having someone who's just really difficult and, you know, we run across people like that out soul winning where they're just so obstinate and, and you know, opposing everybody and everything Someone's got to live next door to those people. <laughs> right? So maybe you, and sorry if you are, but you know, the, the right thing to do is to try to do things face to face, deal with the situations, handle it uh, peacefully, and, and move on from there. And this is, this is a, a very highly uh, stressful situation for, for Esther, especially. Right? For a woman who's not as um, strong. I mean, men are stronger than women in general and, and more equipped to face why men are leaders and, and, and you know, more equipped to deal with these types of conflicts in general. But um, she asked for Haman to come and so she, she wants to do this at this banquet. Verse 6 says, and the king said unto Esther, so, um, so they come to the banquet and, and the king, look at too, he's just saying, cause Haman to make haste. Like, like he's behind Esther here and he's showing that Okay, make him do this. She asked for this. It's going to be done, which is great. It should already be encouraging unto Esther to hear that. Verse 6 says, And the king said unto Esther at the banquet of wine, so they show up here, what is thy petition? He said, well, what do you want, right? I mean, you came to me. Here we are. We're at the banquet. What is it that you want? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? Even to the half of the kingdom, it shall be performed. So he's continuing to say, you know, just, hey, ask and you shall receive. Right? Now, previously... We've seen the king being symbolic of, like, Satan, right? <laughs> Giving Haman this power to do these wicked things, and, you know, and there's all these bad attributes. But in this story, and this is what I'm talking about, when, you, when you're looking at symbolic things, and we're looking at these stories the way that they play out, you can have those roles change based on just what's going on, because it's just a type. I'm not saying the king of Ahasuerus was Satan or God. It's just in these events that are transpiring, he's, he's, he's showing this role like he is God, like he is this benevolent God that just says, hey, ask and you shall receive, right? Unto one of his children, unto, unto someone that's beloved of him, unto his wife in this case, right? What do you want? I'll give it to you even unto the whole, this half of the entire kingdom could be yours. Whatever it is, basically, it's, and we see that phrase oftentimes in the scripture. It's basically just saying, what do you want, right? I'll, I'll give you, I'll basically do just about anything that you ask for, I'll do for you. Uh, verse number seven says, and then, then answered Esther and said, my petition and my request is, if I have found favor in the sight of, my, of the king, and if it please the king to grant my petition and perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them, and I will do tomorrow, as the king has said. She's putting it off another day, right? Now, it doesn't say this explicitly, but I believe that Esther was nervous and trying to buy more time. She's having a hard time saying it because now it's like, uh, Haman's right here, the king's here. How do I say Haman wants to kill us? And, and you know, like, so she says, well, okay, come to the, I've got, a, I've got another banquet prepared for tomorrow. Please come to that, and then, and then I'll tell you what it is that I'm asking for, just to try to, to build up the courage a little bit more. That's what I think is happening with Esther, okay, internally, right? From her perspective, that's what's going on. But as we continue to read, I think even that seems to be in God's timing of events, that she doesn't bring it up until the next day. I don't think she's aware of this while everything's going on. But I think, I know that God knows how things are going to play out. And as we continue to read the story, it is amazing all the events. And I'm going to go into that in more detail, but, you know, the king's not able to sleep. We see here at the end of the story, 
how um, his wife and his friends tell him to make this gallows. All of those things play into every single event that, that transpires in the destruction of Haman, in the, in the saving of the people of God. In that full salvation, every single event here is playing out. Now, when you're in the moment, it's hard to see God's hand. It's hard to see that direction. There's uncertainty. She has to have the faith. She has to have boldness and courage to go forward and do this because she's doing what's right. But she can't see how it's playing out. And in her mind, she's just going like, oh, I can't do this right now. Okay, I'm going to do this tomorrow. Please, can, can you come to the banquet tomorrow, right? Whereas God's going... Yep, this is how it's going to play out. Because these extra events are going to work out. And this is the difficulty for us in doing the right thing. Is that unknown? And of course, that's where faith comes in. Turn to Psalm 27. Let's go forward a little bit from Esther. Psalm 27. And look at verse number 11. The Bible reads, Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. This is pretty similar to what's going on in the story, right? Haman is an enemy, and we need, you know, they need God's counsel and his guidance to teach them in a way, lead them in a plain path because of mine enemies and deliver me not over unto their will. They want to kill me. They want to kill us, right? Verse 13, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So all of this could have just been too much for me. I could have just fainted and just given up and just said, forget it, we're done, we're toast. Unless... I had believed, unless I had that faith knowing that I can still see the goodness of God and trust in God to see me through, which is exactly what Esther needed here because, I mean, hey, this command has come from on high. She's already, he's already got the approval of the king. How am I going to get the king to turn back on what he's already promised to happen to, to make this execution happen and for all these people to die? Everything's against me. I could just give up now. But that faith in the Lord having that faith in the, in the land of the living to see the goodness of the Lord. Verse 14 says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And that is what we need to remember to have that mindset of you know, things that happen when you're doing right. When you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, when you're making the right stands, when you're, when you're walking that path, and there's so much uncertainty in front of you and you don't know what to do, just wait on God's timing. You say, but I don't know how this could even come out good. I don't even know how things can work out. Wait on the Lord. And you say, but I'm praying to God to just deliver me out of this problem right now and he hasn't done it yet. Wait on the Lord. You don't know right now how it's going to turn out yet. But stay strong. Don't faint. No, have the faith that God will deliver you. God will see you through this. Just wait on him. Because his timing is perfect. Stay the course. Esther didn't give up here when I'm sure she wanted to give up and just say, well, forget it, it's nothing. She pushed it off till the next day, but she said, okay, I'm going to do this tomorrow. And she had to rebuild her courage, but continued and didn't faint and didn't stop and said, okay, we're going to do this tomorrow. And you know what? God worked it all out. And no matter how hard it must have been internally as a struggle for Esther to do this, not fainting, not giving up, persevering, keeping, moving forward, standing for what's right. God worked all of this out miraculously. When everything played out, it's a lot easier than to look back and go, wow, look how God worked through this whole situation. And I brought him up a week or two ago, Joseph, right? Joseph had no idea when he was sitting in prison, when he was sold into bondage, that he was going to be number two in charge over this whole kingdom. No idea. No clue. Never could have thought that. He's sitting in prison. He's elevated to the good position in prison, right? But he's still in prison. He has no idea what's going to happen. 
but he stayed the course continuing to live and do what's right and just trusted in God to see him through. And he did. Now, I'm sure it didn't happen as fast as he would have liked it to have been. I mean, every extra day you've got to spend in prison and in, in those bad situations, you don't want to be there. You don't want to have this threat over your head of someone just out to kill you and conspiring to kill you and getting a whole group of people together to come and destroy you. Every day you want just that burden to be lifted. But you've got to wait on the Lord and trust and have that faith. God will deliver us. Like Mordecai had, remember? He said, you know what? Even if you don't do this, I know that God's going to deliver us. Somewhere, somehow, God is going to make this thing work out. Strong faith in God. But it's His timing, not ours. So as we pray, and we're doing the month of February, we're doing a prayer challenge, we're praying for things to happen, right? And oftentimes, and I do this too, look, I want things to happen right away. We pray for things that are immediate needs and things that we want to have happen right away. And sometimes they don't happen right away. It doesn't mean that God's not hearing you and it doesn't mean that, that God's just, you know, like just not going to answer your prayer. We have to understand that it's in His timing. God allows us to go through some pain and suffering sometimes and, and oftentimes it, it will work out for our own benefit or for greater good by going through that, little, that, that pain, by going through some of that suffering. And that overall, when we maintain that faith, will help us and it'll help make you stronger and make you stronger in the Lord and stronger in faith. And we can see example after example after example of God doing that very thing. So much, let that be an encouragement to you as you go through your difficult times. But let's keep reading here. Now, this day is over for, for Esther. She's tried, but she, she didn't quite get to spit it out yet, what she wants. She's put it off till tomorrow. Now we're going to see Haman and his reaction to all this. Haman thinks everything's about him. And oddly enough, this is about him. Not in the way that he thinks, right? His own pride has completely blinded him. Let's look at Haman here, verse number nine. Then went Haman forth that day joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate that he stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. So Mordecai is just this thorn in his side. He looks at him and, and he's in this great mood and then he sees Mordecai and it just turns him sour and he's just indignant. Man, I hate that Mordecai. This is, this is Haman's attitude, right? It says verse 10, nevertheless, Haman refrained himself. So like, you know, like he wants to do something about it. He wants to go over there and, and you know, whatever. But, but he says, no, I'm going to go home. It says when he came home and he sent and called for his friends and Zeresh, his wife, and this, this kind of should speak volumes to you about Haman and the amount of pride he has. He calls his friends and his wife. And let me, uh, when we read this next verse, how many of you do anything like this? Be like, hey, friends, hey, hey, yo, hey wife, come over here. I, I got something important to talk to you guys about. Look what it says in verse 11. And Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children and all the things wherein the king had promoted him and how he had advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. Hey, everyone, come over. I got a story to tell you. Man, look at all this. Look at all this money I got. Huh? Look at this nice house. Look at this. Look at this. Look what God's done for me here. <laughs> well, I'm not in Haman's shoes. <laughs> There's a one. <laughs> Haman's like, check out all my money. Look at all my cash. Go check out my Ferrari out front. Hmm? <laughs> what do you think about that? I've got this great position. What do you guys think, man? Isn't that cool? It's, uh, I'm pretty great, huh? Who invites your wife and friends over to brag on yourself? <laughs> right? Nobody's better than me. <laughs> no one has more money than me. No one. Than <laughs> it's pride. 
And, and there's so many people out there like this. Unfortunately, but think about, isn't that how all the celebrities are? Yeah. I mean, these people have all these riches and stuff and, and they, they have these TV shows and they go into their house and they show off their house and they show off all their stuff. And, they, you know, and people will eat it up. Yeah. But it's still superficial. Because the people that eat it up, it's because they're covetous too. It's because they just want the things that they have. And they think that if they spend enough time around them, maybe they'll just get some of what they have. It's not because they care about them. It's because they're just covetous themselves. And when you're greedy and lofty in your own eyes, just full of pride, and you have this great covetous heart, you're going to surround yourself with other people that, oh yeah, they'll give you praise. They'll give you that glory that you're looking for. Oh yeah, you're so great. His friends and his wife are probably saying, you are awesome. I mean, you're, you have, you, you're right. You have more money than anyone I know. And the king has just, I mean, you are this powerful person. You're great. But you know what? They don't really care about him. And you're going to see that again in the next chapter when things don't work out so well for Haman. They flip on him in an instant because they don't care about him. And when people are so lifted up in pride, turn if you would to James chapter 2, going along the same, the same vein of thought of not regarding these wicked people that just have a lot of money, right? They have a lot of riches and they want to boast themselves of their riches. James 2, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Saying, don't be a respecter of persons. You don't have to care about, you know, hold, hold one person in higher regard, regard over another. And the purpose being because of their money. Right? Because of their status. Oh, well, I'm going to show this person more respect than that person because this person has a lot of money. Because that shouldn't matter at all on how you treat people or how you talk to people how much filthy lucre they have. I don't care how much filthy lucre you have. I'm going to treat people with respect equally. It's not about how much money you have. Verse number two says, For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? So if we have someone come in today, and they're, man, they're set up, they've got that nice suit, they come in, they've got a gold necklace, and they've got these, you know, fancy jewelry, Oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, hey, roll out the red carpet. You come on in, buddy. We've got this. Get out of here. Get, get, get out of here. And we'd start getting the seat. Bring up, bring up the best chair, right? Sit down right here. You're our guest of honor. No. Look, if Donald Trump showed up, or anyone for that matter, I mean, I don't care. Some politician, some celebrity. Some celebrity showed up. I probably wouldn't even know who they were unless they're some old celebrity, right? Because I don't even know anymore who, who, who's, who's popular or whatever. I'd just be like, okay, I, I would treat them normal anyways just because I don't even know who they are because I don't care. I'm not into the, into the fame or whatever. So people would be like, don't you know who that is? I'm like, no. <laughs> it's a person. We're not going to, but we wouldn't do that here and we shouldn't do that here just as much as, you know, from time to time, we do have people who may be homeless or, or whatever that, that stop in the church. You know, if they want to come into the church service and they want to sit down and, and fellowship and be part of church and everything else, they want to come in and do that, hey, sit wherever you want. It's open seating. Right. Just like it is for anyone else. We're not going to say, oh, well, you, we don't like the way you look. We don't like the way you're dressed. So you're just going to have to sit back there in that corner over there. That's wicked. You don't deal with people that way just based on, on how much money they have and become a respecter of persons in that regard. The Bible says in verse 5, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? He's basically saying, isn't it the poor people anyways that, that receive Christ? 
Isn't it the poor people that have the faith that are going to end up inheriting the kingdom of God? They have this great inheritance in heaven, so why would you treat them so poorly here on earth just because they don't have anything right now? I mean, the poor people have all this faith. You should be treating, if, any, if you're treating anyone with respect, how about you treat the person who has an inheritance in heaven, who's going to be walking the streets paved with gold, who's going to have a mansion in heaven, as opposed to this filthy person who may have a lot of money and a lot of riches right now on this earth, but is going to spend an eternity burning and roasting in hell. You got your priorities screwed up. Now, the Bible says not to be a respecter of a person, so you just treat them equal. But it doesn't even make any sense, spiritually speaking, to, to be looking down on people that don't have that, just because they don't have some money now. It's stupid. Verse number six says, But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? And, you know, let this rebuke go out. Anyone who's just in awe and, and holds up these idols that are out there that are popular in this world that have all this money, that blaspheme the name of God, but you just love looking up to them and you love knowing everything about them and you love watching them and, and seeing where they live and all the money and all the riches that they have and you just are enamored by that, you know what? Shame on you. Aren't they the ones that oppress people? Aren't they the ones that, that blaspheme the name by, that, by which you're called? Your Savior? Don't be holding them in high regard just because they've got a bunch of, just because they've lived this rich and lavish lifestyle. Turn to Psalm chapter 10. Psalm 10. That's why Mordecai didn't hold Haman in high regard. Because he knew he was wicked. Because he's the person that's blaspheming that holy name by the which Mordecai is called. He's the one that's oppressing the people. He's that rich person that's ready to oppress the, the, the poor people or the common person. And he wants everyone bowing down to him because he has a wicked heart. Because he's a son of the devil. And Haman's going, no, I'm not going to respect your person. And I'm not going to bow down to you. Psalm 10, look at verse number 2. The Bible reads, The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. This is a perfect picture of Haman. Again, he's boasting of his heart's desire. Oh man, look at all this stuff. And just making his boast of all this stuff that he has, of all his heart's desire. And those people are the ones that bless the covetous. And those friends are just like him. They've got wicked hearts too. Now they may not, they may not be as bad as him or whatever, but they're around him. Again, as we're going to see, they have no loyalty to him. At the end of the day, they say one thing in this chapter and we'll see later. They say another thing later on, basically saying, well, why did you do that? Don't you know? I mean, he's a Jew. <laughs> like, you guys told him to do that. Because you're just yes men. Right. You're just going to go ahead and agree with anything he says, just like the false prophets did. You know, and the kings of Israel are going, Okay, let's, let's, let's see what God has to say for us. And they just have all these yes men around. Oh, yeah, the Lord's with you. Peace, peace, go. God's with you. God's going to bless you. You've got this. The Lord's with you. When Joshua is like, is there, not, is there another man of God here? Like a real man of God? Someone who is actually going to tell us the truth? Well, there's Micaiah, but, you know, I don't like him. He always says bad things about me. bunch of stinking yes men that are just going to tell you whatever you want to hear because they respect your person but they don't respect you they don't care about you the person that loves you was going to tell you the truth and the person that loves God is going to tell the truth verse 4 here in Psalm 10 the wicked 
through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. He hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. This describes Haman to a T. That wicked Haman. He thinks, I mean, he's riding high. Nothing can go wrong for him. Oh, how quickly he's going to fall. Pride goeth before destruction. One other quick point I want to make on, on what he's bragging about, because we live in a backward society today. No one would be surprised at him bragging about the glory of his riches. People brag about their money all the time. Oh man, I've got so much money. Something to brag about, right? I mean, it's not, but, but in the world's eyes, yeah, sure. Or the power, right? This position, man, I'm this, I'm this important person. I'm like Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos or whoever, you know, I just, I got, I'm the CEO and I've got all this money and power and influence, right? People are gonna brag about that. And it makes sense to people today to brag about that. But, and, and think about, I mean, he has riches and power. He's like, like right next to the king in power. So he's pretty high up. And you know what he includes in both of these things? And the multitude of children. I've got a lot of kids. Now the wicked people today aren't going to brag about that because of how far things have turned satanic against children. But this, all of these things would be things that should be counted as blessings, right? So being in a position of power, that could be a blessing, right? Having a lot of money could be a lot of blessing and having a lot of children is a blessing, right? We shouldn't brag on any of those things. We give glory and credit unto God and stay humble and say, well, God's blessed me. If you had all the riches that Haman had, that's a blessing. You say, well, God's blessed me. Thank you, Lord, right? Don't let this money get to my head. Thanks. Thanks. It could be here today, gone tomorrow. Job had all this stuff. He was well-respected. He had a lot, of, a lot of money. He had a lot of influence. He had a lot of children. He was blessed of God. But he didn't have the pride in those things because when they were all removed, he just said, well, you know, Lord's given, Lord's taken away. Right. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Haman has all these things and he's just bragging on them. But that, that point of him having... Children being a blessing, even from a wicked person, during, you know, in the right culture, when people actually have the right view of children, is something to count as a blessing. And that's what the Bible teaches through and through. You don't have to turn there, but in Genesis 24, verse number 60, the Bible says, and they blessed Rebekah. So when Rebekah was going to be Isaac's wife, she receives a blessing from her own family, Right? This isn't a fake blessing. They're blessing Rebecca and said unto her, Thou art our sister. Here's the blessing. Be thou the mother of thousands of millions and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. It's a blessing. Thousands of millions, a lot of kids. <laughs> You're like, I, don't, I only had one. I don't know how you could have any more than that. Thank God Rebecca's family didn't have that attitude. Oh, man, two. I, just, pfft, I can't even, I couldn't ever have, I got my tubes tied or, you know, whatever. I, like, children are a blessing. It's a blessing to be told, hey, be the, the mother of thousands of millions. Amen. Psalm 127, 3 says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Children are a blessing. And we need to hear that over and over again in a society that wants to just demean people who have larger families, people who have a lot of children. Am I right? Do you hear the, do you hear the degradation out in public from people who just, oh, they want to look down or know that you because you have, you have a lot of children. Okay, my wife's dealt with it. I haven't. I don't know why. <laughs> People don't, I don't know what it is. People don't, don't speak their mind as much around me, but they do around the ladies. You know, shame on them for that too. Yeah. Yeah. 
You want to talk something bad about my family, say it to my face. Right. Don't be giving my wife a hard time. Face to face. <laughs> Children are a blessing. Let's, let's finish off this chapter. Look at verse number 12. So Haman is just boasting of himself here. Verse 12 says, Haman said, Moreover, yea, Esther the queen did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared by myself. And tomorrow am I invited unto her also with the king. Basically saying, I'm so, I'm so VIP. I mean, it was nobody but me and the king. Like, she made this banquet for the king and for me. No one else was allowed. And I've got another one I'm going to tomorrow. Special party, me, the king, and the queen. Yeah, yeah, you should be real, really looking forward to that, Haman. But look at verse 13, and this is really telling for someone who is so full of themselves and so lifted up with pride. Think about everything he just listed. I mean, isn't that what people in the world are just seeking after anyways? Money, power, right? Being VIP, just having this great position in the world. Look what he says in verse 13. Yet all this availeth me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. This is the wrath of the heathen. This is how implacable reprobates are. How unmerciful, how nothing. I mean, his mind is just stuck on this one person. You could have the whole world, but one person isn't bowing down to me and, and he just needs to be stamped out and destroyed. And all the joy that he should be getting from everything that he has, he says it's like nothing. Which shows you how empty just being caught up in covetousness is because you'll never have enough because there's always going to be something that's just going to get in your way. And, it's, and in this case, it's, it's a child of God. It's someone who's going to stand for righteousness and not bow down to a wicked person. And guess what, Haman's of the world? There's always going to be people like that. The Antichrist is going to behave the same way. Oh, you're not taking the mark of the beast? You're not going to worship? Because how do you take the mark of the beast? You have to worship the beast. In order to receive his name, you've got to worship the beast. We're going to be like, no. Sorry, I'm not bowing down in worship. I'm not going to fall down before a man. Not going to happen. Not going to fall down before the beast. Not going to take that mark. And that's going to enra enrage the Antichrist enough to wage war against the saints and to just try to execute them all just like Haman was doing here against the children of God. All this availeth me nothing. So long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Verse 14, Then said Zeresh his wife and all his friends unto him, Let a gallows be made of fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. So this is setting up the timing of the Lord. These events right here, that gallows wasn't made prior to this banquet, right? Him bringing up anything about Mordecai specifically under the king hasn't happened yet. If Esther would have brought this stuff up today, I mean, things obviously would have worked out differently, but not to the same impact and extent. Like God still would have delivered, I believe that, but, but there's a reason why God wanted things to happen this way. Because there is no doubt. You could have said up to right before this point, well, I mean, of course, he's going to help out his wife. He loves her. He's going to bless her and everything. But the, the events that surround this whole story, God's hands are in it. And I, I, love, I love the book of Esther. We're going to get into this. I don't want to get ahead and, and just not have anything to preach in weeks to come because I start talking about what's in chapter 6 and what's in chapter 7 and, and all the great, amazing timing of this story. But it is just that cool um, let's get encouragement by this because even in the darkest hour, even in the worst times, we can trust in God and that, and that all things truly can work together for good to those that love God, to them that are called according to his promise. Amen. So let's borrow a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for 
this great story, this encouraging story. Lord, help us to stay the course. Help us not to faint. Lord, help us not to be respecter of persons and not to just um, bow down to people who have a lot of money. Or we shouldn't even care uh, what, what anyone possesses, any filthy lucre that they possess. Lord, it doesn't matter. I pray that you please help us to look on, on the heart, help us to look on things that matter and to um, not be a respecter of persons. Lord, I pray that you would just um, help us understand the, the, what the Bible teaches on everything and not be influenced by the propaganda of the world and, and when people are trying to just talk bad about having children and things. Uh, help us understand the, the, what your word says and what you teach on that subject that, hey, children are a blessing. I pray that you please help us to stay humble and no matter what blessings you give us, that, that you'd help us to, to just retain humility and to just be thankful for what you've given us and just understand that, well, these things are all going to pass away anyway, so we're not going to be tied into them, Lord. And um, God, I pray that you would please just help us also to have that faith and not to faint and to deal with things face to face when they come up and to, to not back down. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.